Hello. So Middle Ages for Educators is so thrilled today to welcome uh, Professor Emily Hutchinson, who is going to tell us about the story map, Anti-Pollution Measures and the Common Good in Medieval Paris. The story map examines and maps the sanitation measures imposed in late medieval Paris all of which claim to serve the common good. And this is the work of uh, Professor Hutchinson with the help of Christopher Rancier, um, or as we might say down here in the United States, Rancier, I, uh, or I don't know, actually that might be the appropriate um, Canadian pronunciation also. Uh, would you care to confirm or deny? It's actually Rancier. Rancier. So, oh, I was okay. It's neither Rancier. In any case, um, so many thanks to both of you for doing this. So many thanks for making this marvelous site. Um, I invited you here entirely for selfish reasons. First of all, because I adore your company, but second of all, because I adore this site, and I am desperate to know how um, how I can use it how best to use it in my, my future teaching and research. Um, and I decided to try to uh, be a little less selfish and, and uh, make it possible to share this with others. So first of all, can I ask you um, how you got the idea? Sure, yeah. This is actually um, one branch of a much, much larger project that I've been working on for a few years and we'll be working on into the foreseeable future on um, the history of late medieval Paris, mostly under Charles VI reign. And it's uh, a project that I approach through the lens of space and place. And um, alongside some of the academic work, I was trying to figure out how to best make some materials available to the students that I teach, because I teach here at an undergraduate university in, in Calgary, Alberta. And I teach a course on medieval Paris here and other medieval courses. Um, but I, you know, I just wanted to make some source material and some of you know, the, the research that I do more available to students in, in a way that I felt would be appealing to them. And so, so that's part of it. But while I was doing this project, the larger project on Paris, um, and also teaching it in the class, I, I recognized very quickly that it's almost impossible to do such a history without dealing with the environmental footprint of the city. And so I started looking for, for materials that would help me better understand um, not just sanitation measures. At first, I was just really interested in, in the, the whole environmental footprint, um, including resource acquisition and, and so on. But I very swiftly kind of um, focused in on pollution and, and sanitation measures. Um, so that was that was kind of the, the first main reason. But to go come back to the teaching, um, you know, I was there were a number of different sources that were available, both um, secondary and lots of primary sources available only in French. And my students are Anglophone here in Calgary, and they simply couldn't read it. So I was spending a lot of time translating things in my lectures, and I thought it would be a really great idea to have everything in one place. Uh, so I was trying to figure out a way that I could bring all of that together for them, not just in you know PowerPoint slides, but a, a permanent resource that would be available to those students so they could you know have access to primary sources and that they they could deal with some of the the issues that the, the project itself deals with um, you know the I've written it as though I was writing any peer-reviewed academic source I tried to be as rigorous as possible uh, but I was really writing it for my students and um, so it you know this is its first publication it hasn't gone through a journal process a peer review process. Um, but I really, I wanted to start here to make that material available, as I said, but also um, what I find with, with teaching undergraduates at the very least is, is you know, the, the, more, the more I include of, uh, of visual components, the more likely they are to feel connected to the past that I'm teaching them. And, you know, in my own work, I've spent quite a lot of time mapping things out and, and I wanted to do the same with this project. But I also wanted to include a number of other visuals that would that would really capture the imagination and, and help them 
make sense of the text that's on the one side of, of the story map and the images or the maps that are beside it. And I felt like it would be a lot easier for them, especially the visual learners, but not exclusively the visual learners, to make those connections and to, to feel a part of the history in, in a more um, acute fashion. So, so that was really, I guess, the, the main motivating reasons for, for undertaking this project. Um, I'll also say, you know, I do think that it's important for us to recognize that we're in a really interesting time as academics, that academia is changing. And it's really hard to foresee exactly how academia is going to change in the end, but we're in the midst of change. And our undergraduate students at the very least, like they, they wanna learn in different ways than, than they have been traditionally. Um, I still assign peer review articles and books and so on, but, but they want to engage digitally with things. And I think that it's really important for we medievalists who have always been at the, the vanguard of the digital humanities to stay current and to, to really connect with students in this way so that we, we enable our, our disciplines to survive. Well, I, I love that. I envy your students and I'm just uh, so eager to, to, to bring my students into the mix too. Um, and I'm also just really struck by the obvious timeliness of the topic. I mean, I don't know when climate change isn't a problem, but it is sure one that sure presses on us, uh, weighs on us now. And so it's just, you know, so, so important to have that modern in the medieval to help engage the students. I'm, I'm totally sure. So uh, I, I would love it if you could just kind of walk us through the, the website and show us how it works and, and how we can uh, start to think about using it. Absolutely. Um, I will say first though about the timeliness, I, I, that was one of the other reasons why I wanted to do this project and to do it in the way that I did because, um, you know, I live in a province in Canada that is very dependent on the fossil fuel industry. And so I, you know, the, the society that I live in here is, there are a lot of climate change deniers. And um, there are a lot of people too who understand the implications of the crisis we're now facing, but, but aren't necessarily um, motivated to do anything substantial about it because our provincial government is so reliant on the oil industry. Um, and, and also that um, at an individual level, we don't, you know, even people like myself who who are really concerned about the environmental crisis we're we're facing, um, you know, the reality is the truth is that I don't always make the choices that I know I should be making, and that was that was another thing that I wanted to poke at in this pro in this project, and I thought it might be a way of engaging students, especially in this culture that I'm I'm in, where you know a lot of people are unsure or doubtful about climate change and its implications. Um, so I thought it would be kind of an interesting project to, to think through what measures the government put in place um, or attempted to put in place, how efficiently it enforced those rules and the extent to which people were either cooperating or challenging, right? So to look at the carrots and the sticks offered by the government, you know, to kind of gauge as best as possible what was effective, but also to think about people's own responsibilities and where the evidence allowed and we don't have a lot of evidence, so it's hard to make a lot of, of clear um, uh, assertions about where they stood. But I wanted to test out as much as I could um, how people were responding to the rhetoric that was that was, that was being um, fed to them re relating to the common good, just like we are being fed that same that same type of of line um, that this will benefit us all in the future. Um, and to do what I could to, to assess whether people were, were on board with those ideas um, and, or you know, disinterested or, or just disinclined for whatever reason, you know, even convenience sake um, to, to follow them. So I thought that would be kind of a relevant way of approaching it that, that might um, encourage our students here to think a little bit more critically about what's happening. Um, I guess we'll, we'll see <laughs> we'll see if they're on board with it or not, but that was kind of underlying the, the structure of the thing as well. So I will walk you through it, but I just wanted to say that because I do think it's kind of relevant to how I've organized things. Oh, and yeah, I, thank you. Yeah, and I want to say about Christopher Rance here that um, he was a former student of mine and um, he's been working with me on this project while he was an undergrad and now he's at graduate school. 
and he's still working with me uh, on this project and many other things. So I wrote most of the stuff and I made most of the maps, but we we organized it together, we edited it together, we, we constructed it together. So it was really a collaborative project. Um, so I wanna make sure that, that he gets full acknowledgement of his contributions. He's He's been a wonderful um, co-author and, and uh, I love working with him. So, um, so I just wanted to, to mention that. Okay, so what we did, it's this is my first ever story map. So it's a little long, I, I admit it's probably too long. It's like a mini book. It's longer than a journal article. It's about 18,000 words. And, you know, when I first wrote it, um, you know, it was just, it was too clumsy and too clunky for students to use in an effective way. And so what Chris and I decided was to break it up into chapters. Initially we had kind of organized into subparts, but it, it got unruly. So we organized it into chapters so that when students come to use it or others, right? It's not just for undergraduate students, anyone can use it. It's, it's academically rigorous, even if it hasn't gone through the peer review process. Um, but what we wanted to do was to kind of um, introduce, first of all, what our, what our research questions were in our argument and to kind of walk through what sources we used. And then to talk a little, because the first part of the project is, is looking at the political rhetoric surrounding sanitation and pollution. And um, one of the, the main themes that, that emerged very quickly is, um, is the, that they have, to, they have to follow these rules for the sake of the common good. And so um, that was initially something that I wanted to, to pursue in the first part, kind of talk about the, the themes that emerge from a close reading of those ordinances. Uh, of which we have many. And as I did that work, we, we discovered um, a lot of connections to the theory of miasma from, from the medieval period where, um, you know, the theory where noxious smells are the cause of infection and pestilence and so on. And that was very obvious when, when you read um, a bulk, the bulk of those ordinances, we really see those themes coming forward. So that first chapter kind of deals with, um, with the, the, the rhetoric that was that was um, advanced by the, the royal government and put in the hands of the, the city's government. Um, so that's kind of the backdrop and it, and it remains important all the way through the, the text. Um, but then the next chapter is really about context. So giving a context to Paris, the structure of Paris, um, talking about the streets in particular, which was one of their main concerns where pollution was, uh, where, where, when they were talking about pollution. Um, so I wanted to kind of give students an opportunity to understand the layout of the city and how, how it worked and who was responsible for what. Um, and then street sanitation focuses is really a sub part of infrastructure because it focuses in on street sanitation as one of their primary concerns for pollution. Um, so again, this is really about kind of a top down perspective from the, from the, through the lens of the royal government and the, and the city's government, what they were hoping for and what the rules were essentially. Um, but even in this chapter here, street sanitation, we start moving into examining the efficiency of these rules and really examining both the carrots and the sticks that were offered by these governments. Um, and then the final chapter is, is really questioning the extent to which they were, they were um, policed, how they were policed, and whether or not ultimately we can say these were effective or not. So that's kind of the, the logic underlying the chapters. And when you go through it, um, you know, one of, one of the things that we really like about it is the aesthetic that we were able to put together. Um, you know, all of, the, all of the quotes taken out of primary or secondary sources are highlighted in, um, in a different color, in bold, in italics, so that students understand that those are primary source or secondary source quotes. Um, this is one of the maps. This is the, the basic template of the map that I, I created for this and other projects. And it's based on other maps that have been produced, for example, through the CNRS and so on. But, um, but I've been working on it for quite some time. So it's very, very detailed uh, with thankfully with the help of Alpage. So thank you, Alpage, for your wonderful work. Um, but so, so I use this map and various layers of it throughout the course of, of, the, um, of the project. Um, 
Yeah, so the, the introduction is, is, is an introduction, sort of introduces some of the concepts that frame the, the, the uh, project that follows healthscaping, which Guy Geltner is, uh, he, he, I don't know if he didn't really coin this term, but he coined it in the medieval context um, in, his, in his wonderful book um, from 2019. And so that kind of frames also the structure of, of, the, of the project in its entirety. Um, and, you know, we flagged our arguments, which of course you wouldn't do in a peer reviewed article, but we thought it was really useful for students to, to be able to hone in on what, what the arguments are. And we tried to develop that in a clear and concise way so that they would, they would be able to follow. And then we deal with the source material, the problems with the source material. Um, I won't go through all of the different sections, but just, just so that you, you know what to sort of um, point to when it comes to using this in the classroom setting, whether undergraduates or graduates. Um, and then we, you know, talked a bit about translation and maps and then currencies, because I talk a lot about currencies, different finds and so on throughout the course of, of the project. But really, um, you know, the way that I use it in my class is because it's pretty long, I don't assign the whole thing in one go. I assign it chapter by chapter or in, you know, the, in the, the first time I, I taught it, I taught just two chapters in one week and then we focused on um, two chapters in the second week and then the final chapter we, we focused in on that and we were using other primary sources and stuff. So I kind of spread it out over three weeks, but I had planned for that. I think you could truncate it to two weeks depending on, on what you do with it. Um, I mean, I had them read all five chapters plus the intro and conclusion, but you could, you know, like with anything, uh, it's up to you. But I do think chapter two, um, you know, the one that you might be able to get away without reading is maybe the infrastructure if you're not super keen on learning the ins and outs and the finer details. Um, but, but it's pretty well laid out, I think, for students. They can navigate their way through it really easily. Every time a chapter changes, I change directions um, as, you know, that visual cue that we're moving into something different. Um, every pair, every section has a subheading so that students, again, can follow really easily and they don't get lost. But these long excerpts from, from sources I thought were really important because again, we want, I wanted to make that, that information available to students. Um, you know, I couldn't translate the whole document per se, but I wanted to include huge chunks wherever I could, um, which is something that we don't necessarily do in our peer reviews as well. So again, it was really like I had the students in mind when I was writing this. While I tried to write it like I would write anything, I, I was also mindful of my audience and I think what we've come up with ultimately is something that is really legible and engaging for students. And it's very pretty. So if I do say so myself, lots of maps all the way through that I explain. Um, whenever I include a map I'll, or an image, I often say at the very end um, something about it. So this is a close up of the owl market, for example, while I'm talking about the owl market and an ordinance that was issued with respect to its sanitation. Um, lots of illuminations and we tracked down the information for it and, you know, made sure that we were using Wikimedia, uh, uh, Wikimedia, Wikimedia Opens or Common or whatever it's called. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just, it's a really, I think, a really well laid out, if I do say so myself, I do think that it works really well. At least the students, my students found it really helpful to kind of walk them through my thinking. Um, and it enabled us to ask a lot of questions of our source material and again to not to make direct parallels between the past and the present but but there's enough in common that that they could see its utility and its relevancy so so that was uh, another another goal of ours it's just too cool for words i mean i i just um uh yeah i i'm speechless literally um i do i do i remember that you had um labeled a bunch of uh public human waste sites or something like that was that there was something where you had you had a bunch of places where um or, or toilets or something there's something i remember or, or environmental disasters is that what i'm thinking of well later um I have tried to map out some of the places where we see delinquencies, for example. That's what I meant. I'm so sorry. That's yes. no problem. So this is a map where I've mapped out all the crossroads. The reason being that um, you know that a lot of these ordinances were issued in in 
the general crossroads where all information was was um, communicated to Parisians. And then some of them are very specific about, you know, the make sure you publish them in these crossroads, you know, the, the usual crossroads, but also these places and they'll specify. Um, so I thought it was useful to kind of map out first the, the general, the generic ones where they always publish news. Um, and then later on in, in the text to, to focus in on um, specific places where they, they argued it or where they communicated those ideas. Of course, right now I can't find it off the top of my head. Oh, no, it doesn't matter. Oh, oh here's a good example. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So this is an ordinance that was issued where, you know, it was published in all those those traditional usual places. But then it was also cried out in these specific places. Why? Because the ordinance was dealing with Place de Grave, which is now um, Place de Hôtel de la, de la Ville um, right here. So it was about keeping the space clean. And so they published them in all of these different Carrefour. Um, to make sure that that everybody in the region who is living there would understand their their responsibilities and hopefully follow it. Um, so it's kind of cool it's when you read those. What I was looking for. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. We also we also mapped out some places where um, delinquents were found. Sorry, it's in the next chapter. So this is the chapter on delinquency, and. Um, there's this really wonderful book in French, unfortunately, so not available to my students, um, but Katia Weidenfeld uh, in, back in 1996 wrote this really great book on the voirie, on the, um, like the streets and, and its upkeep in Paris. And so she's got all this information in her, her appendices of, of sources she was able to find that speak very specifically to delinquents who are caught in the act of colluding. And I just, um, I just used her annex because of COVID, I wasn't able to get to the archives myself, but um, I used her annex to look for things that, are, that were specific to either the King's jurisdiction or the city's jurisdiction. There are other jurisdictions in Paris that she spoke, uh, that she looked into, and um, I just didn't do that in this particular project. And I mapped them out basically. So um, one corresponds to this one source here, two corresponds to this one. And three and four and and then we were able also um, to use a google map to this is Place Maubel those of you who know Paris uh, will probably recognize it immediately um, so this is a google map that's embedded in story maps it's, it's wonderful story maps is so wonderful because you can you can upload any media it can be images your own maps um, it can, you can use their maps you can upload videos gifs any media you want you can upload into these into the into the slides that you're developing so it's it's just so flexible and it's easy it's so easy to use it's so easy to construct um yeah so so we had some fun and then uh, i just want to show you this one map where we just trying to find it uh yeah so these are like uh saint martin des champs um the priory of saint martin des champs was a delinquent uh, the, the king of Sicily and his wife, or uncle and aunt to the king, were delinquents. Um, so they are specified in a series of ordinances for not cleaning. Um, twice over the span of five years, they're still not cleaning up their mess. Um, yeah, and then we, yeah, we mapped out more stuff. Again, this is all from Katia Weidenfeld, these ones here. Um, so, yeah, so we tried to, of course, like map item three. It's a little clumsy, but it's over here, Place de Grève. And so when you go through the chart, basically, um, it's mapped out here. And we were able to also map it out in a Google map at some point, somewhere. <laughs> oh, here it is. Right, so you can see the two maps side by side. So I don't know, it's, that's, that's what we, we attempted to do to, to kind of bring students into it and to really feel a part of the space as best as they can in a, in a two-dimensional um, platform. Uh, and, and so far, I, I feel like uh, the students were really responding to it very positively. Wow, I can't wait to use it. I can't wait to use it. Um, I can't wait to see what the what the students make of it. Um, do you have any uh, any final thoughts, or do you have a, a sense of the sort of findings that you came away with, the things you want to investigate further, just before we uh, we let you? Uh, yeah, I mean, 
one of the fun things I think is that, you know, you can go through the, the project and you can find, like, I have a lot of different findings. Um, like, like all historical studies, it's, you know, the, the best we can say is it was complicated, right? Um, you know, I, part of the project is focusing in on the themes that are developed in the ordinances. And so, you know, that's mostly discourse analysis. And I think, you know, it's really, really easy to see at least how it was pitched at the citizenry and to understand the themes that, that were the most current in the time. And, and, you know, when you're reading that, you're thinking, oh yeah, this is, this is perfectly sensible. And, you know, of course the citizens were on board with this, but, but like all peoples, um, you know, they were very well informed, it seems. These ordinances were issued really publicly in these public spaces over and over and over again. Um, but, but when I looked at the effectiveness and the efficiency of the ordinances, it is probably what we expect that, that actually it wasn't enforced very well. For example, the fines were, um, they fluctuated between 60 sous parisis, which is about 60 shillings, I guess, and 40 shillings, and it, and it kept fluctuating. Sometimes there was a prison term attached, sometimes there wasn't. And, and I found for in one um, six month period that a series of different ordinances all on the same issue, street cleaning, um, you know, one time it was 60 with a prison fine, then it was 40 with a prison fine, then two days later, another one issued without a prison fine. And so I think it, it, these ordinances were causing a lot of confusion probably amongst the, the populace and, and they probably to some extent tuned out. Um, I'm guessing, we can't know for sure. Um, but there, I, there is also evidence of, of people, you know, living up to their responsibilities dutifully. Uh, there's, there's a whole story that I draw from Katia Weidenfeld's work on um, an area of Paris where the citizens demanded that the, the overlord take care of the streets and they paid for it, but that he organized the cleaners to come in and, and take care of it, right? So there's evidence of that. Um, and there's evidence of people getting caught in the act of dumping. And here's what's I think really interesting, notwithstanding you know, the sticks of 40 shilling fine plus pris imprisonment for a short period of time, um, when it came to them being fined, they were sometimes only fined five sous palisi or eight sous palisi or nothing, just have to clean it up. So you know, there wasn't a lot of follow through on the sticks, I don't think. And so um, you know, that's, that's one of the, the things that we found as we did our research. Wow, and, and, and one that I am gleefully eager to incorporate into the, <laughs> the broader issues of, uh, of the mm, implementation of criminal justice. But I... Um, I could talk to you all day about this, but I will I will leave it there, and I'll hope that um, our viewers at Middle Ages for Educators, if you uh, want to know any more, that you'll contact uh, Professor Hutchinson, but also that you'll let her know how you're using it and what you think of it, and um, any questions or comments that you have. Yeah, I would love. Uh, yeah, but anyway, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. And, um, and, 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 you know, we're, we're just so grateful to see such exciting projects. Um, and remember, she said it's easy, so we can all do it. Yeah. too. I'm going to be doing more and um, just on different topics, but I, it is really great. It's really easy for us, us as educators to learn and to implement. And this is going to be open access. So anyone who's allowed to use it, um, we'll put a citation on the website and so on. But I really, really appreciate the opportunity to introduce this work. And I look forward to any feedback any of you have. But, but thank you to the Middle Ages for Educators for having me on here today and talking about this project that I've been working on forever, it seems. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, we're honored and I will end it there. Okay, thank you.